Hey, Zod, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm happy to say that we've got Nick Carter, who's um, agreed to join us. Um, Nick, Nick's got 30 minutes, so, and um, Caitlin Long is uh, joining us as well for only one hour. Excellent, excellent. So, um, I, uh, Nick, I've invited you up to speak. I'm here. Hello, hello. Hey, Nick, how you doing? Doing great, doing great. Glad I saw this. Yeah, happy to join. Okay, yeah, we've been trying to get you up. So really, um, I've, uh, we've never actually done, I don't think we've ever crossed paths um, together on a space together. So I uh, really wanted to get you up. I just gave um, a presentation on um, my experience of going through Operation Choke Point 1.0 when trying to launch a bank in the UK. Um, and uh, I went through all the history of when the Isle of Man tried to make Bitcoin legal tender um, to try and fill in some of the gaps of what's being experienced in the US right now. Um, so you may find that um, uh, interesting to go back to a bit more of the historical context with Bitcoin and crypto companies. Um, back then. Uh, but while we've got you here, um, so I tried to give um, an overview um, of uh, your your original um, publishing of Operation Choke Point 2.0. Um, and really what we'd love to hear from you, Nick, is your experience of, I think when you first published this, it, it, it probably came across as a crypto bro you know, that's um, a, a VC in the crypto, in the Bitcoin and crypto space um, that is probably experiencing challenges with some of its portfolio companies um, and creating a bit of a conspiracy theory that those that don't back Bitcoin and crypto um, would use in order to ridicule into what really um, I think is pretty much uh, undeniable um, and, and really pointing out some of the, the flaws and impacts it's had on the greater U.S. banking system. So I'd love for you, Nick, um, to, to give us like uh, your quick intro on um, what it's been like going through uh, that journey from when you published that paper to where we are today. Yeah, for sure. And I see Caitlin's here. Um, so I'm sure she's tons of good insight as well. I mean, yeah, the first blog post I wrote on it, I, I've actually been talking about choke point for a while, even before the latest round of issues. I mean, what we know now is that after FTX failed, that's when things began in earnest. Uh, the bank regulators saw it as their role to prevent another FTX, and they decided to go after the crypto-focused banks. Uh, so that was around November, and then it accelerated in Q1 of this year. Um, and um, Q1, or actually really January this year, um, a bunch of coordinated actions started happening between the Fed, FDIC, OCC and the Biden administration itself, the White House. And so at, the, at that point, it was pretty clear that there was some, you know, fairly coordinated attempt to, at a minimum, sideline the crypto industry or to prevent crypto firms, uh, in their view, injecting any systemic risks into the banking sector. Uh, that, that was the pretext, at least. So in early Feb, I, I wrote the article, the first one, saying, hey, something's going on here. There's an attempt to marginalize the crypto industry, and it looks like choke point 1.0. It's the playbook that we all know that they used against payday lenders and firearms manufacturers and other industries. And they're basically recreating the playbook here. The custodian denial um, in, in January was a, a huge part of that. Um, the Federal Reserve creating new rules that they entered into the Federal Register without going through the standard comment period. The White House putting out a statement in January, uh, contemporaneous with the denial. These were all red flags to me. I wrote that article. People thought it was a conspiracy. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, Signature uh, was seized. Uh, Silvergate uh, chose to voluntarily liquidate after suffering a number of issues. And, um, you know, tons of stuff has happened since. I think we've had plenty of evidence since then that you know, not only is choke point 2.0 real, but it probably actually exceeds 1.0 in terms of the vastness and aggressiveness of the action. And frankly, it's not even that covert. You know, it's kind of out in the open. Uh, so I don't think anyone's calling me a conspiracy theorist anymore. Uh, right now, what people in the mainstream are saying is, well, yeah, you know, it's happening, but it's a good thing. Um, the, the crypto bros brought this upon themselves. 
the banks made risky bets and failed as a consequence. Um, and crypto should be sidelined. Crypto should be, you know, the financial system should be insulated from the, you know, craziness of the crypto market. So basically people acknowledge that it's real, but the critics of the industry generally think it's a good thing. Um, unfortunately for them, it's unconstitutional. You know, bank regulators are not allowed to determine what businesses and what industries are allowed to do business in the United States. That is against the Fifth Amendment, right? It's a violation of due process. Uh, it's outside of their regulatory ambit. That's just not what they're there to do. They're there to supervise the banks, not to tell the banks who to do business with. Um, so that's kind of where we are today. And I, I know there's a lot to dive into, but I'll pause there. Okay, brilliant. Um, and so obviously, like one of the, um, sorry, Caitlin, how, how long have you got with us? So I think Nick's only got about 30 minutes, right? Yeah, I've got a, a full hour. Okay, great. So we'll get as, as much as we can um, there. So it, the interesting point, I think, is that um, the executive order was given to go through the congressional process. Um, and obviously, you can use regulations of this whole classifying something as high risk. Um, how, do you, how do you see the difference between trying to circumvent the political process or actually genuinely uh, saying there is, there is high risk in these, um, in these banking practices um, and therefore it's just kind of a, a normal process as opposed to a political process? Yeah, that's a really excellent question, actually. Um... You know, could you say that the bank regulators are just well within their rights to label crypto a high risk industry? Um, and so is this like normal course of business, basically? And um, the question there is like, is there anything, is there any like solid evidence that banks that service crypto are inherently unstable and like can't do their main job as banks, which is to manage uh, you know, duration risk, liquidity risks. And you might say that in the case of Signature or Silvergate, that that's maybe evidence of that. But in the case of Signature, you know, we need to answer the question of whether they were solvent when they were uh, requisitioned. So it, it appears still that they weren't actually insolvent at that point. In the case of Silvergate, I would argue that there's extenuating factors, that there was a very aggressive campaign against them from certain senators, uh, certain short sellers. Um, and of course they were facing some investigations at that time. So, you know, maybe you could make that case. But I think the broader question is, is there a way to bank crypto startups in a safe way? And if the answer is of course, yes. And that was proposed by Caitlin, right? That the full reserve model, you're not facing the same risks here that, um, that these ordinary banks were facing. So. You know, I don't think there's anything inherent about crypto, about banking crypto companies, that means that you can't functionally be a bank. But that is the tack that the regulators are trying to take now. They're going to the banks and they're saying, you can't have crypto as your primary business. You can't, uh, crypto can only be an ancillary part of your business. That's what they say. They've gone to the bankers. They've said you can only 15% of your deposits serving this industry. In so doing, I think they're overreaching. And uh, I, I don't think there's any like factive case that you can make that says the crypto is inherently impossible to serve from the perspective of a bank. Yeah, which is a perfect segue to um, Caitlin's side, because really the, the solution to high risk banking, whereby, um, you know, people could you've, you've invested a, a chunk of those deposits and you could be invested uh, have to sell at a loss because people need to demand those deposits. The ultimate way is just to say, okay, you can serve the crypto banking industry, um, but why not be full reserve? And so that brings up another interesting um, situation. I'd love Caitlin to comment on and answer this question. And then maybe you can go through your, your history with what you tried to do with Custodia is if the government allowed a full reserve bank in a time like this, is the issue that because there is no risk in a full reserve bank, that everybody could take their money out of a fractional reserve bank 
uh, and put it in a full reserve bank? And is that the political issue? Well, that's definitely part of the political issue. But the honest truth is that that's not what would happen. And for two specific reasons. One is the capital requirement is really high. Okay, so the fees that a full reserve bank is going to have to charge in order to co cover, you know, its its capital um, is going to be high, right? So by definition, a full reserve bank, which is not able to subsidize the 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 fee structure with interest income that a fractional reserve bank can do, by definition, the full reserve bank is a high is the high cost producer. Uh, now, some people are willing to pay that cost. It's it's their it should be their choice. Um, but the other it, it, the other piece is that full reserve banks, because they don't lend, are not going to be able to pay competitive interest that a fractional reserve bank is able to pay. Now, what people don't understand, well, they should, but the, but the obfuscation of the existing system is no one knows. And we saw this in, in the crypto lenders. No one knows what the real interest rate should be to compensate the depositor for the counterparty risk that your financial institution is going to default. And I was warning people, Simon, I think I, you and I were on a couple of podcasts together. I was warning people, you know, these 9% yields look fat, but no one knew whether the BlockFi's and Celsius's and Voyagers of the world were, were solvent and those 9% yields or even, you know, 20% yields, no one knew whether those were going to counter, uh, compensate people for the default risk. And in, in the end, guess what? They didn't. They were way too low. Um, so coming back to the full reserve question, it boils down to full reserve banks by definition are going to be the higher higher cost producers and lower interest rates, if any at all. And if, if traditional fractional reserve banks are scared of, of competing against a full reserve bank, it's because they're pocketing the spread and they should be paying that interest income to their customers. Interesting. Um, Nick, before you've got to go, um, I know you're an investor in the sector and um, as somebody who's invested in over 100 companies myself, um, I obviously wanted to speak to all the companies and figure out what they're doing with their banking solutions. Um, and many of them had already, you know, offshore banking outside of the US because prior to being able to secure US banking, um, when the industry you know, was being a bit when the bank when it was possible because of these handful of banks. Um, they already had their backup banking, but now it's become their primary banking. So it hasn't actually choked the companies or the industry. It's just taken um, their banking outside of the US. Um, are, are you experiencing some of the things, uh, so obviously the same, I'm, I've seen a big exodus towards Hong Kong. Um, I've seen Hong Kong come along and say, we'll license those exchanges now. Um, we see this as an opportunity. We'll bank those companies. Um, and uh, so all it, all it ends up doing is just moving, you know, kind of like when there was an exodus of miners from China to America. Um, when you have these big overarching uh, things. The impact is that you just end up taking all of the the business, the industry, the data over to another country. Um, so, what do you think of the long term? And and we've also seen a big a big pushback on um, a, a coordinated global pushback on the dollar um, from jurisdictions that uh, have have a lot to gain from not using the dollar and the dollar not being the world reserve currency. What what type of pushbacks do you think has come as a result of this? Yeah, I think you nailed it. I mean, I'm seeing the same in my portfolio. Well, I see three reactions. I see offshoring. So as you say, like we're crypto people, and so we're used to struggling with banking. So we're kind of trained to deal with this. Uh, so certainly some of our startups are looking overseas, including Hong Kong, although I'm a little nervous about Hong Kong because uh, I think since... Uh, the political change there, it's effectively a part of China. So it's not somewhere I personally would domicile myself, but, uh, you know, I don't decide for everyone. Um, and I'm seeing people moving to more crypto native solutions. So just holding more stables and uh, there's, you know, pretty good tools even for cash management. 
corporate treasuries in, in stables. Um, and then some folks are just hunkering down and hoping things change in the U.S. But, you know, those first two things, it's basically the U.S. accelerates the transition away from the regulated U.S.-based financial system to either foreign locales. And there's always going to be foreign governments that are basically buyers of the crypto industry and are looking to play that game. That's just natural. You'll always see that, whether it's Hong Kong, Singapore, maybe certain parts of Europe, Middle East, elsewhere. And they're pushing people to more crypto native solutions. So they do risk losing oversight of the space. And frankly, I would argue increasing risks overall um, for all the hate that uh, U.S. financial regulators get. They're pretty sophisticated. The more they push things outside of their scope of influence, uh, the less understanding they have and the less ability they have to actually influence outcomes there. Uh, the biggest beneficiary of all this choke point stuff is actually just Tether, right? So that can't possibly be something that U.S. regulators <laughs> want is for Tether to be empowered. Isn't it ironic? Kayla, I don't know if you want to chime in. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. It's, it's ironic because Tether was created in, in many ways because Bitfinex got – uh, it, it back at, when it was banking with Noble Bank in Puerto Rico, and, and it got um, and Noble got uh, debanked by Wells Fargo, which was the correspondent bank for Noble, and uh, and 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 Tether. Basically, that was that was where the regulators got the very thing they feared, which is a true digital dollar operating offshore. And, you know, Tether says they operate entirely offshore. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, they certainly have their U.S. dollar banking offshore. It's one of the greatest kept secrets in crypto. Who's clearing Tether's U.S. dollars? But uh, anyway, it's it, the whole thing is offshore. Nick, you're absolutely right. It's uh, it has pushed a lot of people towards Tether. And here's the great irony. I know the, what the Fed is trying to do with, with uh, switching over from LIBOR to SOFR, which is the the um, reference rate for most U.S. dollar do denominated floating rate debt. L LIBOR is controlled by the London banks. It's a London interbank offer rate. SOFR is a U.S. control rate, the secured overnight funding rate. And so this was the way for the Fed to basically take power away from the euro dollar market and bring it all back on shore. And the great irony is <laughs> Tether exists entirely in the euro dollar market and, and uh, the uh, the unintended consequence of the policy has been to empower Tether. Yeah, that's um, that's an interesting, a, a really interesting chat. And full disclosure, I'm a, I'm a shareholder in Bitfinex and Circle, who issue uh, well, Bitfinex is a partner company to Tether, and USDC is issued by Circle. I'm a shareholder in Coinbase from before it went public as well. Who's partners in USDC? Um, but that was fascinating to watch, like the the DPEG of. Um, USDC as a result of the real-time pricing of people factoring in how much money was uninsured at a bank and the efficiency of that of that market in real time, um, and then just seeing the market cap of USDC shrink and BUSD shrink as a result of many of the other regulatory issues from CFT and SEC as opposed to the banking side, and then some of the the stuff that looks like it's coming uh, from DOJ and just seeing that in real time. But maybe I, I maybe their play was to get everything into Tether and then they were um, looking to launch something on the Tether side as well, um, which, uh, again, is, the, is this game of cat and mouse because that just ends up driving people, I think. I, I did a poll saying, what would you do with your Tether uh, if for any reason you had to get rid of it? Uh, and I think I think it was eighty six percent said that they'd buy Bitcoin. Um, so it, it seems like it, the the importance of these decisions of making Bitcoin decentralized seems to be the end the end game of a lot of this stuff. And yeah, the innovation that comes from um, stables. Do you do you think that um, do you think if Operation Checkpoint two point zero continues to this extent, um, eventually they find some banking institutions that are willing to embrace it? Or do you think it becomes this offshore dollar market long term? I know we're about to lose Nick. So Nick, do you want to take that? 
Yeah, I mean, there are definitely, uh, you know, a dozen or so banks that are emerging to fill the gap. And I've, you know, talked to quite a few of those bankers and I'm encouraged and, and heartened that they're willing to run towards the fire and deal with all the regulatory harassment that comes with bank and crypto companies. The problem is that there is now this effective requirement in place, courtesy of the Fed, that these banks uh, can't uh, really fully service the crypto space. Um, they, um, you know, the demand is, is, you know, really no more than around 15% of their deposits can be crypto focused. So it means that there is still a kind of a shortage. Uh, there's just not enough supply from the smaller banks that are the ones filling the gap. And it doesn't look to me like there's going to be any large banks imminently that, um, you know, g- gain an appetite to bank crypto firms. And then as far as far as the dollar settlement networks like Sen or Signet are concerned, I don't see that being replicated, unfortunately, because those those banks were nexuses that served all the banks in the industry. That can't be redone now uh, with these smaller banks with only, you know, 10, 15 percent of their deposits being crypto related. So it looks to me like we're going to have kind of enter like a bit of a winter as far as banks servicing crypto are concerned, at least in the U.S., uh, so it's not like catastrophic. It's not the end of the industry, but it's it's kind of bleak for now. And um, all right, what where do you think that comes into the Fed now CBDC conversation? Uh, well, you know, I saw some people rumoring that the uh, signets and uh, takedowns or nationalizations had to do with Fed now. I think that's actually a coincidence, but uh, you know, certainly this whole thing. The whole crisis we're seeing now is actually has the net effect of um, basically killing off a lot of the regional and uh, um, and community bank sector. I don't, I don't think there's any reason now why people would choose to use those banks if they feel that deposits are uninsured, if yields are much higher with treasuries. So that whole thing is a massively centralizing force, and uh, it does funnel deposits towards the systemically important institutions or into treasuries directly. Um, and so I do, I do think it adds fuel to the fire for a CBDC, because now the question is, why would anybody hold their funds in a commercial bank? Why not just bank with the government directly? Well, if that's the case, why doesn't the government become that bank um, instead of just um, issuing treasuries? Um, so certainly feels like somewhat concerted effort, although in the US, I'm kind of heartened uh, by the political pushback against CBDCs that I'm seeing both in Congress and at the state level. So I'd be shocked if they did try and push a CBDC through. I don't think that they would have support for it. Um, so thankfully, there's people holding the line there, uh, at least as far as I can see. Yes, it seems like a great way of getting, um, if you can get your debt ceiling up to $51 trillion. Um, seems like a great way of finding a market for your um, treasuries, uh, which is uh, uh, educate the world on the whole uninsured banking side. Uh, and you found internal demand for your treasuries where there may have been a lack of demand as a result of some people trying to re- remove some of their geopolitical exposure. Yeah, um, unfortunately, I have to hop, but uh, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm sure the rest of the conversation will be awesome. Hey, Nick. Yeah, thanks for joining. Really glad. Um, And we'll catch up another time. Thank you. Amazing work. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Nick. Can I, Simon, can I pick up on one of the the threads here that um, there's, there's something much broader than crypto going on, which is that the banks in the U.S., the bank's technology has atrophied. And it really goes back about 20 years when the Fed told what was that atrophy it it just it it didn't keep up okay and we and we've seen this with the the wall street journal story that broke the news that when silicon valley bank was trying to transfer collateral it got bank of new york to agree to transfer the collateral after the 4 p.m deadline but the fed didn't have the ability to transact and needed to run a test trade. And then they made the decision that the wire, the so-called wire room, which is where the you know, Fed wire happens, was closed at 4 p.m. 
And there was a really interesting, I, I, I apologize, I don't um, have off the top of my head the, the person whom I should credit for pointing out that the Fed kept the, the Fed wire room open after 4 p.m. in order to help AIG. And it didn't for Silicon Valley Bank, which is an interesting fact. Um, so what's really going on here is where I'm going is there's, a, there's an anti-tech move that's broader than just crypto. And it's, it's because certain banks got ahead of the Fed in its tech, okay? And, and so the, the, about 20 years ago, the Fed basically said, look, all the banks in the U.S., of which back then there were, you know, seven or 8,000, it's now down to 4,600-ish. Um, all the banks had to connect with the Fed, integrate with the Fed through an approved integrator. And the Fed, and, and these firms are... Pfizer, FIS, Jack Henry, those are the big ones. And basically they were granted de facto monopolies by the Fed because all these banks had to choose one of those approved integrators and buy their software. Well, as someone who, who, uh, who's starting a bank, um, one of the interesting things that most folks don't realize is that those approved integrators, which again have the monopoly, are they, they have such pricing power and such um, asymmetric power over the banks that they require the banks to, to enter into five to seven year contracts with them that are irrevocable. And if the bank goes out of business or if the bank gets sold, the, the, those contracts have to be paid out in their entirety. This is one of the biggest issues that, hit, that happens in bank m and Okay, I'm getting into the weeds here to make a broader point, which is that when the Fed gave those companies de facto monopolies requiring all the banks to have to pick one of those what do you think they did with their technology do you think they had any incentive to upgrade it no most of them haven't even had apis application programming interfaces for 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 more than a year or two and the ones that they that they have are really not something that a software engineer would consider an api Okay, so now step back. Now that I just painted that picture for you, that the Fed itself didn't keep up with the technology and that these approved integrators didn't keep up with the technology either. So now you have these three banks, Silvergate, Signature, and Silicon Valley, that all had very active API um, development businesses. They basically built middleware. I, I talked to one of them. I won't disclose which one. Um, they spent four years building the middleware to be able to offer a real-time payments network that was running 24/7, 365, that had on the back end the you know the horse and buggy rails, right? They had a Ferrari front end, but they had a horse and buggy rail on the back end. And and how do you how do you integrate to make something like that work? You've got to build what software engineers would call middleware. Okay, but but now recognize what I just laid out for you is that those tech-forward banks were very scary to the Fed because they didn't have the upgraded systems themselves. Now, the Fed has known this. This is not controversial. I'm not saying anything that's new um, they, because the Fed has known this. They've been working on their real-time payments initiative since 2016, which was the precursor to Fed now. So they've been working on this for seven years. Um, but the interesting thing is that as we saw in that Wall Street Journal article, the Fed couldn't do anything that was out of the norm in order to accommodate Silicon Valley Bank. And it would have had to have run that test trade and the wire room had already closed. So was it because the Fed didn't want to or was it because it didn't have the technology to? And if there are any journalists listening, I hope you pick up this thread because there's a very big story behind the scenes that I don't think anybody's picked up yet which is that this is really truly an anti-tech move more so than anti-crypto. It's broader than just crypto. Fascinating. Um, you, you are giving me PTSD remembering um, when we were trying to create the bank in the UK and um, we were looking at the different technology providers and the fees yep. that they were charging was just, there's no way to build a business model that works here. Correct. Um, and, and we, our, our solution to them was, can we just build direct onto the Bank of England API? Uh, and, that, you know, and that's what we, we were trying to propose to them. 
Um, and instead, they would no. you have to build on top of another Correct. fractional reserve bank and they keep their monopoly. Um, and any new entrant has to build on top of them. It's just introducing these layers and layers of fees, just making it completely in- infeasible on just this yeah, crazy technology. Or layers and um, layers of technology providers when we have the ability to move money in real time now. If that technology has been around for more than a decade. Why is no one doing it? It's a, it, you know, it's the interesting question. And then, you know, again, one of the other interesting questions for the Fed is how much of wanting, as Nick said, you know, Sen and and um, Signet were the two 24/7, 365 payments networks that that the digital asset industry had been accessing. They've both clearly been, you know shoved into the corner, if not ultimately shut down, right? Nick, Nick has himself done a very good job asking questions. Why is it that Signet was not part of the FDIC's um, receivership program? And didn't the FDIC have a statutory obligation to find the least cost resolution for Signature? And by not selling Signet, which clearly has value, then were they violating their statutory obligations? These are the questions that Nick was asking. But I just painted a context for why they don't necessarily want Signet to exist. And, um, and, and so it, net net, there's, it, it, you know, there, if we step back and think about the implications of all that I just laid out, right? You know, the three of the, the, of the most tech forward banks are now no longer here. And the, the, uh, when I saw this Bernstein um, report that Balaji had t- texted or uh, had tweeted about this morning, they called the U.S. financial system semi-digital, semi-analog. And I think that's true. But the digitization that has happened within the U.S. financial system is not the digitization that now exists with crypto. We have the ability to have digital bearer instruments with no counterparty risk that settle very fast. And people are going to migrate to that because it is better tech. And so we had these tech forward banks that were moving into that sphere and now they no longer exist and their tech is no longer available. So there's a bigger story here. Wow. So it seems like the centralization of banks and the decentralization of technology that operates without banks and that's the whole bitcoin story and the reason why we're here in the first place yeah i think that's right Um, and and by the way um one other quick thing just to follow up on on nick's point and your point to him about how people in your poll 86 percent said well if they get pushed out of stable coins they're going to bitcoin again the regulators may be actually getting what they act what they truly fear um, which is pe- more people going to Bitcoin. Um, but, but, but that is ultimately the big question. And I would add, it's more than just Bitcoin. Lightning Network is, to me, the big disruptor. Why? Because you can move U.S. dollars on the Lightning Network. You can create and transact in U.S. dollars. How? It's just secured by SATs. Okay, so if I want to send you one dollar through the Lightning Network, it's secured in a payment channel with one dollar's worth of Bitcoin. But we're now transacting in U.S. dollars. Okay, this is the biggest to the extent that the Fed's trying to get control of the euro dollar market. This is the biggest euro dollar opportunity is the Lightning Network. And guess what? It's decentralized and eight billion people in the world can download and run the code on their phone right now. So the only question is, in my mind, how fast is this going to take place? That's one of the reasons why we just don't understand why the regulators are shoving all of this into the shadows. It accelerates the, the adoption of these new technologies, not the other way around. Although I, I realized that I kind of submitted a plausible answer as to why they're doing what they're doing. It's because it reveals the antiquated an atrophied nature of their own technology. Fascinating. Um, maybe you could um, give us a bit of background on what Custodia was trying to do. 
um, and uh, where, where it currently stands right now and the, the process you're going through with, um, yeah, with, that you're experiencing, because maybe not everyone knows the story. Yeah, uh, so it's funny, Simon, because you and I've talked about this before. The, I always was focused on the real threat to this industry wasn't the SEC, it was the bank regulators. And, um, you know, most folks have spent their time throwing shade at Gary Gensler, but, but, but I always knew that this ultimately was going to happen. It was, you know, Ryan Selkis at Masari in his year end reports likes to say the single biggest point of failure for the industry, given the market structure that it had, was indeed US dollar banking services. And I think we've just proven that out. Though I will say also, I, I, I don't really care about liquidity. And I'm with Nick Szabo on that front where he says liquidity is a nice to have, but not a must have the it, pulling signature and Silvergate out meant that the, the um, bid offer spreads have now blown out and there is now arbitrage from on the Bitcoin price or the ETH price at different exchanges. And, and those, those, arbitrage opportunities were closed down when people had the ability to move money, move US dollars 24 seven, 365. I'm with Nick. We don't really care about liquidity. We just, all you care about is the, is the ability to transact when you need to transact. You don't necessarily need, if you are somebody who is trying to store the hard earned value of your, of the fruits of your labor in an honest ledger, you don't care whether bid offer spreads are narrow. You just need to know that there is an ability for you to transact when you need it. So I, I, I don't, I don't mind that liquidity has, has, has moved away from the market and these arbitrage opportunities have opened up again. Um, though I do believe the engineers will figure out, and I think lightning is the path, um, a way to move money around the industry a lot faster. They're just not going to be moving it through the banking system anymore. But back on Custodia, what we were building um, is, is, frankly, it, it goes back um, prior to Custodia itself, because as you guys know, I was uh, volunteering in my native state. I moved back from New York to my native state of Wyoming. A lot of folks know that story. Um, it was just a, a serendipity that I tried to donate appreciated Bitcoin in 2017. Wyoming had a bad money transmitter law. I, I helped the state get that fixed volunteered to help the state when I tried to donate appreciated Bitcoin and none of the Bitcoin companies could service a Wyoming customer circle and Coinbase, for example, had pulled out of Wyoming in 2015 due to the bad money transmitter law. And I volunteered to help get that fixed. And then it, one thing led to another and the whole thing snowballed into the broader initiative. And one of the things that we were hearing in 2017 from a number of probably two dozen at least entrepreneurs who testified at the Wyoming legislative hearings that they kept losing their bank accounts. And that was the number one thing that they needed solved because there were legitimate businesses, legitimate startups that got debanked in 2017, 2018, and their businesses had to close their doors as a result. And so that's what Wyoming said about it was actually um, Commissioner Forkner, who's now the CEO of Fortress Trust. Um, so he went, he left uh, the banking regulatory world and started a crypto company, um, he, he came up with the idea of an uninsured charter. Why is the uninsured charter so important? It, go, it dates back to what we started at the beginning in this conversation with Nick. It was Operation Choke Point 1.0. The whole notion that the FDIC could pick and choose which industries by applying backroom pressure, um, which industries the banks were allowed to bank, was something that, uh, that ultimately the legislators in their wisdom in Wyoming really negatively reacted to. That if the FDIC was gonna be over their skis, going beyond their statutory authority and picking and choosing winners through the safety and soundness, I'd put in air quotes, uh, process of regulating banks, then, then all right, we're gonna have an uninsured charter. And if it's an uninsured charter, then it cannot lend. Um, and so the, the charter was enacted by Wyoming in early 2019. There were two processes of public comment. Um, all of this, by the way, was done in public meetings. Uh, and there were two processes of public comment for the rules that were enacted. 
and it and the charter applications opened October 1st, 2019, and nobody showed up. And I was working, there were there were more than 150 interested parties that reached out to the Wyoming Division of Banking back then, and none of them made it to the finish line. And so I was working in and around trying to help companies uh, come to Wyoming. And long story short, when nobody showed up, I rolled up sleeves and said I would do it. Um, and so we started Custodia, a 100% reserved non-lending bank that was, our, our proposal was to keep all of our cash in a Fed master account, plus all of our shareholders' equity in a Fed master account. That's where we get the 8%. A lot of people have asked about how is it that you were going to keep a dollar eight for every US dollar deposit in cash in your master account? Where's the eight cents of extra cash come from? It's the shareholders' equity. It's the, it's the capital requirement. And I alluded to this back earlier. It's a really capital intensive business. So therefore, you've got to charge high fees to cover your cost. And that's one of the big reasons why I've never been worried that this was going to take money out of the fractional reserve banking system, because it's going to be more expensive by definition to bank at a 100% reserve bank. Uh, and then on top of that, um, Custodia is, has proposed to provide custody services for Bitcoin and ETH. So it's US dollars and custody services in a compliant manner. And we spent two and a half years working with the Fed uh, until, and, and, and as, as I've said, it's now, it's now public. We did undergo, we did a lot of work with the Fed last fall in September, October. We got an exam uh, in September. This is all public information disclosed in the 86 page order that the Fed released last Friday. Uh, and, the, and we got an exam letter in October. Bankers will know, of course, when you get an exam letter, you get a decision and you get a list of things to work on if the decision is not no. Well, the decision was not no. We got a list of things to work on and we were working on a remediation plan. There's lots of references to that in the Fed's order. And then all of a sudden in January, total U-turn and um, complete change in posture, and uh, we got blindsided and suddenly the answer was no. So that's where we are. Um, I brought Mike up stage. Mike, did you want to ask Caitlin a question or just add to the conversation? Uh, you know, I was actually just here to listen to Caitlin, Simon. I'm actually babysitting a newborn right now, right. but you invited Congrats. me. So, so I decided to come up. <laughs> Thank you. She's 11 days old and she's rocking in the bassinet while I stroll around in the living room. But, um, you know, I always love listening to to Caitlin. I'm a I'm a believer in in what Caitlin's trying to do. It doesn't surprise me that the powers that be in the banking system would try to make the rules so nebulous that it would basically dissuade good entrepreneurs with good ideas from actually building something of value that might compete in a way with the traditional banking system. So um, none of this is, is surprising to me. I, I hope Caitlin, you used a, a lot of phrases in the past tense there. I hope you're not assuming the war is over yet. I assume oh, no. you're going to continue to. <laughs> To fight, but yeah, maybe maybe that maybe that's the right pl place to take the conversation. Is given where you're at now, what levers do you have? What legal avenues do you have? What what's next? Well, listen, there's there's only so much I can say right now, but stay tuned. I have said publicly, it is far from over for Custodia. Uh, there are certain things, of course, for which the door has been slammed shut, um, but it is far from over. Uh, it is public information that we do have a pending lawsuit that was filed last June. Obviously, I can't speak to that at all. Uh, and then we are an operating Wyoming bank. We got our certificate of authority. We, we actually had two exams. We had a Fed exam. This is all public information now. We had a Fed exam last fall and we had a Wyoming exam. Wyoming gave us our certificate of authority to operate. Uh, we also paid an in independent consultant to review us as well. And they also cleared us to operate. So uh, the one that didn't clear us to operate at the time said, you have a few things to work on. And then months later, of course, um, changed its mind. That's all public information. Again, I'm pointing back to the to the 86 page order. But long story short, we're an operating Wyoming bank and uh, and and have the ability to um, launch. And so stay tuned. It's uh, uh, it's going to take us a little bit of time. We obviously had to regroup, but I think you're going to like what you see. And so I guess the, the follow up question, though, then is even without a Fed master account as a Wy operating Wyoming bank, are there compelling services you can already offer to to people in all 50 states today, even if they're not residents of, of Wyoming? And like what changes if and when you're successful in getting a Fedmaster account yeah. without giving away any non-public information, but what are the 
step function changes that happen with a FedMaster account versus what you can do now. So the Special Purpose Depository Institution Charter, again, uninsured, non-FDIC insured charter in Wyoming, is recognized in most of the U.S. states. It's very um, state by state as to which activities are recognized. And some states like New York make you jump through extra hoops. So... Um, so long story short, thanks to an act called the Regal Neal Act, uh, not, states cannot discriminate against other states' state chartered banks. We have what's called a dual banking system in the U.S. where states charter banks and the federal government charters banks, and they are equal. And so, um, no, it's absolutely not the case that you have to be a resident of Wyoming to be able to do business with a special purpose depository institution. But um, it, in, in many states... Um, it, well, it's a state by state analysis as to, as to which types of products and indeed whether you're dealing with businesses or retail and custodians business model is businesses to begin. Um, and so, so we would not be opening individual accounts anytime soon anyway. Um, different line of question, uh, Caitlin, since um, you're on the board of Cypher Mining, probably not a fact most people know. I, I actually have purchased in the last 60 days, I purchased 2.2 million shares of Cypher. I'm a big believer in what you and Tyler and the team are doing there. Could you share why you're uh, a believer in the long run and what Bitcoin data center businesses are doing right now? Uh, how do you view that? Yeah. Space? Oh, well, b b by the way, I have publicly disclosed that. That is not a secret that I'm on the board of that. And of course, it's in all the SEC filings as well. And I certainly can't speak for them, but I'll speak in general terms. The Bitcoin mining industry is fascinating. And what is happening as you're seeing is the hash rate in the Bitcoin network keeps hitting all time highs. Um, I don't think it will continue indefinitely. There's still a shakeout of, of essentially what's happened in the industry where there was overcapacity for a while. Um, but it is, a, it, is, it is a very interesting business. And what makes me in part interested uh, for the industry as a whole, I won't speak for, for Cypher because of course I'm not authorized to do so, but um, what, what makes me interested as a whole is that you're now seeing hyperscale data center professionals get involved. And um, in the beginning, as you know, Mike um, and Simon, Bitcoin mining was done by, you know, individuals in their garages, right? Um, way, way back 10 years ago when you didn't need um, a special computer and you didn't even need a special chip. But it, 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 it yeah, I've still got my milk crate. Yeah, there you go. So, but it evolved that ultimately you need these application specific um, integrated circuits, ASICs. Uh, and so it, it has turned into an industrial scale business. But what happened is a lot of hobbyists got involved. Now, what, what I'm seeing is that you have hyperscale data center people getting involved. And it is, it is just turbocharging the efficiency of the Bitcoin mining business. And um, I, I wish Nick were still on to talk about the environmental is, a, aspects of this. I am so impressed by the engineers that I've seen in Bitcoin mining, uh, beyond just Cypher, the, just, the, just the, the efficiency and the you know, markets work. They have such an incredible incentive to find the cheapest cost and especially cheapest cost energy and especially if it's a publicly traded company, of which there's a, there are many, um, because of the SEC requirements, they're staying generally a, away from fossil fuels. And so you're really seeing the greening of the Bitcoin network as more capital has come into the U.S. miners and uh, the, the engineering that goes into taking the, the, uh, the power and, and turning it into you know, digital value is just incredible. I'm so impressed, but I'm, I'm not an engineer by background. I just, I, I just, I, I was amazed when I visited a, a Bitcoin mine recently and just was amazed at the engineering and how much it's changed in the last few years and gone to just a different scale. Yeah, I can confirm that. And, and Caitlin, unlike you, I am a reg FD spokesperson for Iris Energy uh, ticker there is IREN. So I'm allowed to say that we are extremely bullish uh, on the space and, and would agree with all of your comments. And I would recommend to people to take a look at both Iris Energy and Cypher Mining. Both companies have no debt uh, on the balance sheet. Both companies develop and design their own 
data centers. They they use their own heat engineering, right? They're they're securing low cost, primarily renewable power. In in Cipher's case, uh, again, I'm not on the board of Cipher, so I can speak about it just as an independent observer. Cipher has one of the most interesting models because they've co-located their facilities with wind farms. So two or three of them are are JVs with a wind farm uh, provider. So basically. Uh, their power is 100% renewable in that case, and it is very, very low cost. And in fact, most of the analysts, including uh, Needham and, and others that, that cover the space, have pointed out that, that Cypher has among the lowest all-in energy costs per, per Bitcoin. So again, uh, really interesting comments, Caitlin, and I, I would say Iris Energy agrees with you and, and, and uh, you know on your comments. Uh, fascinating, actually. Um, it, it comes quite uh, full circle because I believe... Um... I remember um, all of us in some capacity have had a, an interesting relationship with Alex Mazinski. Um, obviously, Caitlin, you were on some of those um, infamous uh, uh, podcasts and, and interviews where um, we were on, we were on together. We were on Simon, together. Was, we criticized it was me and Caitlin. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, one, one interesting thing, Mike, is um, uh, f- very fraudulently a, a, a chunk of our Bitcoin um, ended up uh, with about 120,000 ASICs right now that are that are sat in um, warehouses with only about seventeen thousand of them plugged in, um, and we're going through the process of trying to legitimize those assets for creditors right now. Um, there's a bunch of the the top mining companies that are looking to um, try and support creditors in a in a recovery. So um, you might you might want to take a look at it. It's it's quite an interesting because all of the debt gets wiped out because we are the debtors that were defrauded. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a there's an opportunity to try and put those to good use and turn that shit show into proof of work and something that actually adds to society. So I'd be very um, it would be very interesting to see um, yeah some of those some of those. But there's there's a lot of people in that process right now, so it's quite an interesting turn of events. And that's that's the reason why you're seeing a break in the correlation with the Bitcoin price and the hash rate, which historically had been very correlated. And it's not right now. The hash rate is hitting all time highs. And of course, Bitcoin is significantly off its all time high. And uh, it's what you're talking about right now. There was, you know, there was a bubble, right? We were obviously, you know, at the end of, of ZERP, zero interest rate policy. Uh, there was too much debt, too much money chasing too few goods, too much debt. <laughs> that was uh, brought into the Bitcoin mining industry, and um, and and a lot of machines got invested in with that zero cost money. And now there's a huge shakeout happening, and uh, that's part of the reason why you're seeing hash rate climb to all time highs because the the money was sunk into them, and uh, and and so the investors are are just trying to recover some of their cash. And of course, with Bitcoin's price where it is, it's in general profitable to mine, not, not in every situation, but, uh, but certainly in, in many situations. And so it's, it's like you said, people are scrambling to buy those on the secondary market and turn them on and start mining. Yeah, you yeah. know, one other thing, Simon, I would just mention is that when Caitlin and I were on Scott Melker's podcast with Alex, one of the biggest triggers for me to know that something was wrong was that he took the deposits from customers that were liquid and needed to be available for withdrawal and put it into an illiquid mining business at the peak of the cycle when rigs were at the highest price, land was at the highest price, Bitcoin was at the highest price. The the secret to this industry is that mining is a very profitable business at the peak of the cycle and it's a very brutal business at the bottom of the cycle. And it's progressively getting more challenging as difficulty goes up, hash rate goes up, and the halving happens every four years, which is an effective having right and and the amount of bitcoin that you can even earn from a market share standpoint um and so i knew there was something wrong there when they said they were going to take that business public at a time that nobody could go public uh in the spring of of early spring of last year the other the last point i make on this before i gotta drop off because my my baby's crying a little bit here but um the last point that that i think is really important is that m a is not as accretive in bitcoin mining as it is in software or other industries because each one of these facilities is different. A lot of people are using immersion, some are using air-cooled, some are using hydro, right? Different geographies have different power regimes, different power sources, different power prices, different operational issues, different issues with municipalities who are trying to limit mining in their jurisdictions for counterproductive reasons. And so the thing to understand is that m may not make as much sense 
for good companies in the space as it does in say software where you put two companies together, you get revenue synergies, cost synergies, and that flows through to shareholder value. I don't think you see that here. I think what you get when you combine two or three companies is two or three or maybe six times as many operational challenges without the centralized benefits of, of cost synergies that you would get in a traditional acquisition. So I would say, look at the miners broadly who are eschewing at large scale m a who are basically avoiding it and building out their own facilities. That way they can control their own destiny and understand their own operational challenges. And I'll leave it there. Thanks so much for having me up. That's a yeah, great fine. point, Mike. Yeah, and, and actually, as I've, as I've dug into this mining industry in, in the last year, it's fascinating how different the engineering challenges are per site. And they're very site specific. It's almost like thinking about an architect having to, you know, taking, taking a, um, one of those canned plans for a house and trying to figure out how do I position the house on the site? The, the amount of engineering that has to happen at the site level that is not um, that, that, that is bespoke rather that, that applies to the specific site is just stunning and uh, you can't replicate it. And, that, and to Mike's point, um, that may be why some of these excess machines are having trouble clearing the market, but they, I think they will probably continue to keep the hash rate hitting all time highs for a while yet. And so those of us who own Bitcoin are getting the benefit of that because there's so much extra security in the network with the hash rate continuing to hit all-time highs. Amazing. Um, if we could tie, tie back as well. So um, these different trends. So one, one of the things I tried to cover in the video was the mining trends where we had this exodus away from connecting to mining pools and the hardware being hosted in China um, over to a, a, a big a big chunk that was being done in America um, as a result of geopolo geopolitics. But then at the same time, it, it kind of had a big spike down, but it looks like China's gone, goes through its normal cycle of making a policy, being overly aggressive in the Bitcoin and crypto space, and then slowly bringing it, bringing it back in. And we look like we're seeing that again with um, a lot of the activities and the flip-flop on that policy. How do you think um, Operation Choke Point and, and another interesting trend is the technology trend that you talked about, Caitlin, um, that China is actually the leader in digital payments and fintech. And um, so, you know, cash was disrupted a long time ago. When I was when I spent a lot of time in China, we, everything was WeChat Pay and Alipay. And um, you didn't you know, you, you didn't you didn't use uh, cash or um, the banking system that much. So. Where, where do you think all of this, this goes in terms of the geopolitical pays that um, there, is, there is a lot of an attack on the dollar from different countries? Um, there is a digital payments movement in China and there is an operation choke point that's become very apparent in the US that policymakers are going to need to reverse and, and figure out where Bitcoin and crypto fit. And the fact that they've got all this mining equipment in Texas now, um, could you talk to some of the, the big geopolitical trends and the importance of, of this to get right for the future of American competitiveness? Well, I think it's, it's self-evident that it is important to the future of the competitiveness of any economy, not just America, uh, because we, we have... It's almost like, uh, I'm, I'm going to credit Balaji with this. It's almost like the, the, it's like when the Russians in the Cold War saw what blue jeans were and knew they wanted them, right? And so, you know, that kind of, that kind of zeitgeist helped overturn the Soviet control in 1991. And people have... There are 22% of Americans who own crypto. Okay, yes, it's, is it rife with fraud? Yes, is it rife with over-leveraged business models? All of which should be burned to the ground. Yes, absolutely. But are there legitimate uses of faster, better, cheaper, and more transparent payments? You bet. And that is going to rise from the ashes. And that's why it is of strategic importance to any economy because people will vote with their feet. This whole notion that we're basically going to shove out the, the most tech forward banks and try to go back to the analog world, 
that's just, that's regressive. People won't stand for it. Um, it those 22% of Americans that own crypto are, they do skew younger from an age demographic perspective. And many of the younger folks have never set foot in a bank branch. I just got locked out of one of my bank accounts. And you know what they told me to do? Go to the bank branch. <laughs> I, I can't imagine, you know, a, a, a Gen Zer hearing that from their bank and saying, I've never had to go to a bank branch before. What do I do? Um, because they're, they're just going to vote with their feet is the, is the point. There's no stopping this. And that's what surprises me and disappoints me about the Biden administration choosing to clamp down on this in a way that's going to send it into the shadows because it's not going to stop. They're not going to, they're not going to solve the problem by shoving it offshore and into the shadows. The problem that they're faced with is a banking sector with atrophied technology, old technology that just can't keep up. And I think this just got revealed in a massive way in the last, in the last you know, month um, since, the, since the bank failures and the bank runs began. And it absolutely is an interest rate policy issue. Nick made that point. He's absolutely right. But I think there's a big operational issue as well, which is people expect 24-7, 365 payments in this day and age. And if the banking system cannot provide it and if the if FedNow, one of the things a lot of people are talking about, including that Bernstein report, when FedNow comes online in July, that's the Fed's 24-7, 365 payment system that I alluded to that came out of that Faster Payments Initiative started in 2016. It took them seven years to build. Now, it's coming online in, Ju in, in July, but they're not going to require the banks to keep more cash. I asked the, the question rhetorically. During the weekend when Silicon Valley had failed and there was a question about signature, can you imagine if FedNow had been operating, how much deposits would have been flinging around the system that weekend because you could move it 24-7, 365? And the, and the cash needs that individual banks are going to need are, are going to go up massively. And I have not seen the regulators tell the banks, you've got to hold more cash. And in, in, for the community and regional banks, one of the biggest issues is that because they have not been subject to the Basel III requirements, they have not held a lot of cash. And instead, they invested a lot in long-term treasuries. That story has been well telegraphed in the press. And if they have to liquidate assets, they will be liquidating them at a loss. And that stresses their capital. So there's a catch-22 here. I am not sure that the Fed is going to launch fed now in july because of this very issue it's going to stress the liquidity in the banking system even more than it's stressed now um or the other alternative is that they right now they've proposed to launch it with a one hundred thousand dollar limit and um, maybe what they end up doing is reducing the limit but the other thing that that some folks have pointed out is that in the event that there were a weekend where there was a lot of bank run activity and a whole bunch of money was just moving, flinging around on, uh, on FedNow, the chance that the Fed gates you and essentially shuts that access point down is pretty high. It's kind of like what happened to the hedge funds in the 2008 financial crisis. A lot of them just said no more withdrawals. Um, but that's the kind of thing that prompts a confidence crisis in the, in the status quo system and causes people to go, again, vote with their feet to, be, to download the code and start running some of these open source um, financial technology protocols like Bitcoin, like Lightning Network, like Ethereum, whatever, ha you know, what, what have you. Eight billion people have the ability to download that code and run that code on their phones right now. It is not a question of, of if, it, it is a question of how fast. Fascinating. How was, um, sorry, I heard that um, when the, there were checks were actually used during the pandemic, right, to deliver helicopter money. How, how did that work? Um, it happened through American, these tech I forward think. banks. Yeah, yeah, Simon, that's a great question. The, here's the irony. Some of the most tech forward banks are the ones who helped the government distribute money during the helicopter money phase of, 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 uh, of the pandemic. And now they're the ones under regulatory pressure because their tech is too good so to speak. Of course, I don't think it's too good. I think it's keeping up with the markets, but they're being penalized by the regulators who are behind the scenes saying, 
we can't have these, you know, tech forward banks and certainly not crypto, which I define as tech forward uh, because money is moving too fast, right? Online banking is too good. We have these APIs that can move $42 billion of deposits in the span of a few hours at Silicon Valley Bank. And we got to slow things down. That is not going to fly with, with the users. Fascinating. Um, Caitlin, I was going to invite some people up to ask questions. Like you're, you're free. If you need to go, then feel free. But um, we're just going to invite a few people up. They might have questions for me. But if you want to stay, um, do you want to take some questions? Yeah, I can, take, I can take a couple questions. Why don't we go 10 more minutes? I'm just looking at my schedule. Let's okay. go 10 more minutes. All right. Cool. Azad, do you want to bring a couple of um, people up? And uh, see if they got questions. Let's uh, bring up Chris. You there, Chris? Okay, Chris is trying to connect. I'm here. Hey, Chris, have you got a question for I do. Caitlin? Caitlin, what would prevent, say, an already currently federally chartered bank from doing what you were proposing to do? Is is that a possibility that one of them could just do that? Uh, well, a couple of things. One is, as you probably heard Nick say, that behind the scenes, the banks are being told that they cannot take more than 15% deposits from the crypto industry and or you know the fintech tech forward industry because the deposits are deemed to be too volatile. Um, and so ultimately it's, it's the catch 22 of, it comes down to the balance sheet, right? Could somebody ha that has a traditional banking, sec banking charter do a 100% reserve model? Yes, but the regulators are not going to approve that. Um, and, and so if you change your business model if, and you're an, you're an incumbent bank, this is one of the big reasons why buying a bank hasn't worked. Because if you change your business model, you have to go get approval as if you are a brand new bank. And so the, the regulators are going to look at that and say, wait, wait a minute, you want to be a payment bank? You don't want to lend? No, we're not letting you do that. Um, and so they just wouldn't let them do that. So it's a combination of, Regulators are not going to approve um, the 15% deposit limit. And then also keep in mind, you know, the banks are the region, the, the, the community and regional banks. If you mark to market their bond portfolios, most of their equity is gone because of unrealized losses in the bond portfolios. And that's before we get into what could be a recession and you start seeing losses in the loan portfolios. Banks basically have two categories of investments, bonds and loans. The bond portfolio mark-to-market has, has essentially taken the equity away on a mark-to-market basis from, from whole swaths of the, of the industry. That's well-documented. But what people don't have yet is a sense for what's the real market value of those loans. Those loans are carried at market value. And you know we're headed into a recession where credit quality starts to become a question and you start to see write downs of the loans. Plus those loans are long-term and they also have interest rate risk. So if you were really to mark the whole thing to market, what you would realize is that there's a solvency problem in the banking industry. This is not new, by the way, what I just laid out for you existed before, before it came into everyone's consciousness. So I, 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 I'm, I don't want to make it seem like this is something that just happened overnight. It didn't. It, it happened gradually um, as the Fed was raising interest rates over the last year, especially. Thank you. Next speaker is Bradley. Hey, thanks for letting me up, Zod. A uh, question I have for Caitlin is, um, you know, we talk about um, a bank that is able to cover 100% of depositors and, and not engaging in the loaning business. Um, do you see that as, as something that might happen in, in parallel with more traditional banks? Or do you see kind of the whole idea of fractional reserve banking um, eventually going away? And the reason I, I ask the question is because historically, um, the when when the United States, for example, was on the gold standard, that was a period of time when a lot of sort of middle class and poorer people complained about um, the lack of credit. Farmers, in particular, mm -hmm. uh, Williams, Jennings, Bryan, you know, had that whole cross of gold speech attacking yep. the gold standard. Um, do you 
so do you see a, a, a major shift in, in just how the credit system in this country and, and globally works? And is it going to really um, not be attractive enough to be blunt? You know, you talk about people voting with their feet. Are people really going to voluntarily switch to a system that um, that has such a severe limitation on on the availability on the availability of uh, credit? Well, I think you're getting at something important, which is that if people, if we were in a free market for interest rates, interest rates would probably be a lot higher than they are now. We're seeing yield curve control being implemented by central banks around the world to try to keep a cap on interest rates. And what that's doing is that savers are not able to be adequately compensated for the default risk of keeping their money in a bank and they're pulling their deposits out, which is pressuring the fractional reserve model and putting it in the risk-free investment, which is U.S. treasuries. Uh, and, and as a result, um, getting a higher yield with less risk, right? This is pretty fundamental, and very much a structural issue. Uh, so, um, but I, I think, you know, Saifedean Amos has had a really interesting um, thought. He and I, on a podcast, probably, I don't know, maybe two years ago, talked about is the system, because we knew it was unstable, right? Again, this has been unstable all along. It's just that it's in everyone's consciousness now because it's on the, it's burst into the front seat, front pages of the newspapers, so to speak. But, but is it going to, when, when it does end, is it going to end with a bang or is it going to end with a whimper? And, and Savadine and I both in that podcast agreed it's probably going to end at, with a whimper as people gradually move out of it. Now, so the funny thing is that some of the regulatory moves that are happening increase the probability that it ends with a bang. But, but I still think mo the most likely base case is that people just vote with their feet because of what you're talking about. They're not earning enough interest by keeping their deposits in a fractional reserve bank. And now they've awakened to the notion that there's, there's credit risk um, in, in keeping a deposit in a bank. So why wouldn't they just you know, get higher yields with less credit risk by buying the government treasuries? Um, but governments, the central banks will end up having to keep a lid on interest rates in order to keep the banking system capitalization from being under so much pressure, which is another word for saying yield curve control. And then you've got the complexity on top of it in the US where fiscal dominance is coming to, into play. And essentially the, there's pressure on the central bank to monetize the very high uh, spending in, on the fiscal, fiscal policy side. Um, so to answer your question, long story short, it's a, it's a, the, the, the US banking system is in a pickle right now. Um, with interest rates where they are, and inflation is high, and really it comes down to a trade-off of financial stability versus inflation. A lot of people talk about the Fed's dual mandate, but um, it's interesting, having been at that Wharton RegTech conference that I was tweeting about last week, and, and talking with some of the regulators in different parts of the world, the model that the U.S. has is that the central bank is also the bank regulator, and in, the, in other parts of the world, that's not true. You don't have monetary policy married up with bank regulation. They're separate. And I think there's a lot of value to that model because, um, because monetary policy really should be independent of the banking system's uh, stability. But in fact, it's, it's, all, it's all intertwined at the Fed. Just a bit mindful of your time, Caitlin. Uh, how many more questions would you like to answer? Yeah, let's, let's do one more. Okay. Um, let's bring up up to here. Um, hi there. Uh, I actually had a question for Simon. Do you hear me okay? Fire away, oh. yes. Should we do mine um, after Caitlin? Yeah, yeah. The other question. No problem. Okay. Um, okay, who's got a question for Caitlin? If you could just put your hands up, uh, I'll bring you up. Um, oh, if do we you... don't have any, then should we let you go, Caitlin, and I'll take mine, or you can hang around. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. I... I, why don't I exit stage right? <laughs> okay, awesome. All right, well, so, thank you, you so much. Um, thank you so much, um, Caitlin. Like, keep doing what you're doing, fighting an amazing fight. Um, I've been a fan and watching, and um, hopefully we'll get to see you, see what each other one day again as well. In, um, I haven't been traveling since COVID, but... Uh, I think we used to see each other in the Satoshi Roundtable. 
Yep, indeed. Hopefully we will. The world's opening back up again. It's a, it's an exciting time for sure. Yeah, not Thanks ready to get the vaccine listening. though. Thanks, Anne. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, your okay. question up to here. Thank you, Azad. Uh, hi, Simon. Uh, I'm a long-time follower, and uh, here we are today, fellow creditors. Uh, I would like to share a, th a thought and ask your opinion about it. Uh, it's about Celsius creditors becoming the spearhead of choke point 2.0 uh, and connecting somewhat to what Caitlin told us uh, about the Okay, Fed. let's try and connect the conversations then. Okay, what's the connection? Uh, well, the, the connection with, with Caitlin and, uh, and choke point 2 and your, your video uh, today, the, the live stream, uh, I noticed the Flagstar Bank and the Provenance blockchain connection. Yes. A chain no, no one ever heard about, and yet it's the the blockchain that Nova Wolf chose. So it seems to me like Celsius creditors became part of Choke Point 2.0, more or less by chance, and it explains why Nova Wolf, deeply entrenched TradFi people, as I understand it, are not concerned about uh, regulators, and it would be because they are put in place by regulators. It would also explain the silence from UCC and also their unbridled support for, for the choice of Nova Wolf. Whatever wriggle room the regulators had, uh, had planned to give crypto, it seems to be through, at least in, in part, Flagstar and Provenance. Yeah, so for those that don't know what we're talking about, a, a really strange and interesting turn of events that may even be a coincidence or a conspiracy or um, um, uh, I, the truth will come out. But um, the, the, two, the two different 24-7 um, payment networks, blockchain payment networks, um, that essentially got in trouble because they facilitated the transactions between Alameda, FTX, and all the different groups that led to a Department of Justice investigation um, was the networks that were created by Silvergate um, and Signature, which was Sen and um, Signet. Um, now, as part of Operation Choke Point, um, the only banks that were not allowed to have a rescue from a syndicate of bidders or other banks um, or were, you know, kind of shut down unless you get rid of your crypto business or get rid of the, the block, the, the network, um, were those two banks. So that's uh, an interesting turn of events. But the bank that, um, so uh, Bernie, uh, Bernie Frank, that was um, part of the Dodd-Frank Banking Reforms and Regulations, he was also on the board of Signature, and he stated that um, Signature was not insolvent. Um, when it was uh, asked to close. And um, it literally wiped out shareholder value um, completely illegitimately is the accusation. And there's going to be a big investigation into that. Um, but the bank that ended up acquiring them is um, one of the, the banks that's a part of the, a, a, new, a new blockchain that I've, I tried to use um, called the Provenance Blockchain. And the only reason I used it is because um, a, a syndicate of companies, Figure, um, Nova Wolf, um, and uh, some mining companies, um, are actually putting in a bid in order to drive the recovery for um, Celsius creditors and reorganize um, the assets. And one of the things they want to do is create a security token on that provenance blockchain. And um, the, when, when I wanted to use that service, if I ACH some money in, um, because I didn't have access to the U.S. banking rails, I could swift money in, and then it minted some new stable coins on the Provenance blockchain. Is my my understanding of how it worked. So it, it's pretty interesting that that is also the parent company bank um, that is uh, been been selected in order to uh, drive what is meant to be a competitive bidding process. Um, in order to take the conspiracy slightly away. Um, and I'm open to indulging in it. Uh, it is going to a way more competitive process right now. And so um, I, I've had a call with some really solid syndicates that are putting together alternative plans. Um, and uh, it is it is driving into a more competitive process. But I will totally watch um, that with, with deep interest, either wearing a tinfoil hat 
um, or digging and unearthing what, what may be a very interesting turn of events uh, that we all are connected by. So let's see. Um, thanks for bringing it up. Okay, next speaker is Clayton. Clayton, can you hear us? You're up next. Yeah, I can. Um, I was actually going to ask this to Caitlin, but, uh, and by the way, I posted the article she spoke about, uh, about uh, Silicon Valley Bank. But does anyone know the mechanism that the, I, I see the uh, U.S. government just sold 41,000 Bitcoin. Is anyone kind of familiar with the mechanism that that goes through? And how hypocritical it is that they're actually using the network. Yeah, so I remember um, I, I've been involved in a couple of cases. So um, I remember the Silk Road, um, the the early uh, yeah the early Silk Road coins, um, and they were auctioned off and done through an OTC trade. So you could bid on blocks, and I think if memory serves me right, it was Tim Draper that bought a big block at about six hundred dollars, maybe twenty five thousand bitcoins or something can't quite remember um and i remember everyone was laughing at him because they crashed down to 300 after his purchase um but obviously he got the last laugh um so normally they're um offer they're, they're sent off in an auction um i did notice that um there are there are several big blocks of um, bitcoin coming up so the doj obviously confiscated the bitfinex 119,000 uh, or whatever's left of them bitcoin uh, from the from the Bitfinex hack recovery, um, and DOJ is also in a case with Bitfinex. So, on one side they're holding them, on the other side they're actually entitled to creditors of the hack, and um, which is a very interesting new block of Bitcoin that comes through. Um, there's also the Mount Gox ones that hid in the market. Now they were actually, um, I remember the the fund administrator, the trustee actually just market sold a shit ton of Bitcoin that really crashed the price and then started doing some OTC trades, realizing that that's probably a better way of um, of uh, offloading some Bitcoin. Uh, this particular block from, I believe, came from the Silk Road of the 42,000. Um, apparently, some of them went over to Coinbase. So I'm not sure if they're using Coinbase OTC at the same time as dysfunctional three-letter agencies um, or deciding sending out a Wells notice at the same time as uh, trying to crash a market. But yeah, there's definitely some tinfoil hat investigations to go on there. But if they were good actors, then they would do an over-the-counter trade with... Um, if they're bad actors, then they just stick them on the exchange and try and crash the price. Okay, thanks for that. Let's bring up uh, Zero Apathy. Zero apathy, are you there? If not, let's bring up Anuj. Hey, we'll just take all the, all the last questions now, Azad, and wrap it up, I think. Yeah, so the question is around Bitcoin uh, that uh, right now the uh, US government is holding and they have already sold one tranche of it and they are planning to uh, sell uh, all of them. So is was, this... Was that, is was this that the... actually announced today? Is there a new announcement I missed? Or Yeah. Oh, so, right. I missed uh, that is, today is this, I've been working all day, Yeah, yeah. So. Is this a signal that they are uh, sending through that uh, they are against uh, crypto or also, uh, sorry, is it against Bitcoin? And also, are they, uh, are, are, it, uh, are these actions, uh, the coordinated actions against uh, uh, crypto and Bitcoin? What your, what's your take on this? Uh, my take on it is if I had 42,000 Bitcoins and I chose this moment to sell it, um, then I'm a fucking idiot uh, and shouldn't be in any kind of treasury management. And it's probably why they work in government uh, in the film. To sell, to be able to have access to 42,000 Bitcoins in a drunk, bloody, you know, um, fiat money ridden need to increase the, the tax ceiling and find new markets for my treasuries by crashing the banking system and launching a CBDC if we're putting on the tinfoil hat. Uh, I wouldn't be selling my 42,000 Bitcoin unless um, I've got a big other stash of them and um, I'm trying to send out a signal to the market and spook them into selling. And it's not going to work. It's going to backfire. Um, and congratulations to anybody that uh, picks up some of those Bitcoins 
in in the current market um maybe exactly what gives you and your personal life a different destiny to the US government um i don't know which actual agency is selling them though is it doj uh, i need to look into the news cuz i i missed it all today i was just working without honing in on any news okay so let's uh just a final question from Natty. Yeah. <clears throat> can, can we finalize on your, the de-dollarization of the world? Uh, how is it is the main topic, maybe the fall of the USD reserve currency. Um, do you think it, it will stabilize? Or, 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 which, which is the next state which is going to throw USD away? That's it. Yeah, I definitely think it's a global coordinated um, effort to send massive signals to the market um, as a result of Russia's dollars being deleted. Um, I think that really spooked the the global market and global relations. And, um, you know, we, we've just hit a, a point right now where dollars are still, is still my preferred fiat currency. Um, I still have all my fiat currency in dollars and I have some pounds just because that's the, the currency where I live. Um, and I still hold a, por uh, a portfolio that would benefit from rolling over the dollar um, with a central bank digital currency and allowing the Ponzi scheme to continue. Um, so I still position myself accordingly. Um, but I also have a separate portfolio of what would you do in a change of empire? Um, and I, I do believe that there is a coordinated effort to try and make uh, the, the Chinese central bank digital currency get some global adoption through tied Belt and Road Initiative loans. Um, and I, I think they I think they're, they're going to I think they're going to succeed in, in getting some adoption in various places. Historically, um, a, a world reserve currency changes every 80 years. The longest standing one was the Great British Pound, which lasts 350 years. Um, but historically, they, they, they change every 80 years, and it takes a 20-year transition. Uh, but I do believe that technology and the speed of information might lead to some kind of strange systemic um, event, but I think what what is interesting is in, in reaction to people's fears over their deposits, um, is they've, you know, I, I do believe some have been buying Bitcoin. Um, that's obviously not a massive global trend, um, but they have been moving into Treasury, so they do still believe in the credit rating of the U.S. government, certainly domestically, um, but but globally, um, I think the CBDs is an adoption and it and it all depends on what happens next with any kind of whether we just remain in, in technical and currency warfare um, or whether that escalates to any kind of military. I'm, I, I remain optimistic that it doesn't escalate militarily in a world war level. Um, but I think the outcome of that is, is important. I also believe that there's a greater long term trend that this may be the last, um, and, and I remember um, Jim Rogers, a famous commodities um, investor, we did a tour across um, 18 different provinces in China together talking about, I did the Bitcoin part, he did the gold part. Um, and he always told me in his wisdom, whenever you find yourself saying this time is different, um, then you're probably onto a losing position. Um, but I do believe this time is different in the, this could be a last empire and, and, and technology that I believe a bigger trend is becomes more important than any government. And so I think artificial intelligence in the next two decades uh, can do currency controls um, and management of um, stabilizations of central bank digital currencies significantly better than any human could. And so that, that I think has a, a big play in what happens when we hit that singularity point. And, and I think that happens in our lifetime. Uh, so whether the dollar can continue to roll over um, is still an important currency, it's still a, a, a flight to safety. Um, but 
the rest of the world is is seeing less importance in it. And as I covered in my book, the end always comes when your credit rating um, is significantly downgraded, which was the fall of the banks, Silicon Valley Bank um, and Silvergate. Um, and if, if you remember the 2008 financial crisis, the issue was that there was um, there was not an appetite by Moody's S&P for political reasons where the investment banks influenced them in order to not change the credit rating based upon their mortgage-backed securities and their exposure. And so it was it's political sometimes why your credit rating doesn't get downgraded. But when it does get downgraded, um, and the U.S., the U.S., credit rating did get downgraded during the last financial crisis, um, but it was obviously rolled over instead. But when, when that happens, it's, uh, it changes the dynamics of uh, the bond market, and the bond market tends to be able to forecast these things and tell you the absolute truth. So these are all incredibly interesting uh, times that we, that we live through. Um, I do think we live in a multi multi-fiat currency and Bitcoin world. Um, and I do believe that uh, fiat currency issued by central banks will be faster, um, cheaper, and better for making payments. And the drug to get people to download that wallet and accept it is either some kind of universal basic income or bank failure where you download the currency to not lose your deposit instead of an FDIC back. Uh, backdrop. And I think that will be the drug. I don't think we're there yet in order to do it. Uh, but I think everything's pointing towards that. And then it becomes about how suppressive do you get when you ultimately control all the power of how people spend. And government's track record is that they get very suppressive. And so from my perspective, what I'm seeing right now is the US looking more like China every day and China looking more like the US every day. And meeting in the middle with a suppressive central bank digital currency and the future of the currency that people want to use from my perspective is the one that allows you to save in bitcoin and hard money and doesn't get suppressive around that so operation choke point is a demonstration that when you get suppressive with your policy around technological innovation you could just accidentally crash the banking system. And that's a fascinating thing, which is hyper accelerated by many of the things that Caitlin was talking about, this technology, um, you know, this lack of uh, technology innovation, um, but also the speed at which information is traveling and the fact that we're all discussing this on Twitter spaces. And for the first time in human history, people actually care about the geekiest, most boring topic that I've been studying my whole life, like how banks work and bank charters um, and the laws and regulations around it. The fact that everyday people that have been victims of crypto chapter 11s or bank failures, the fact that the world's speaking about that and we're on Twitter spaces and everyone can engage, what a fascinating time to be alive. And I think that's a, a great place um, to end, I think um, I think Chinese yuan will certainly have an attempt to try and get there, but I think it doesn't really matter in the end because I think technology creates a currency that we probably couldn't imagine, and the only thing that can combat the suppressive reduction in freedom, liberties, and uh, privacies, and everything that's important in to free society, the only thing that can combat that is proof of work. And so wouldn't it be um, beautiful if through some of these uh, failures and, and crazy events like these chapter 11s that we ended up powering some of the most largest proof of work and driving innovation and the whole ESG narrative of trying to take down Bitcoin because it's bad for the environment turns out uh, innovating uh, one of the most significant movements in uh, you know, electricity and technology that uh, really changes the world. And I think that's what Bitcoin has consistently done, consistently proven that whatever you throw at it, it, it finds a way of adjusting um, and uh, we go through the next cycle. So I'm still also a believer that um, 
we have survived the quantitative tightening cycle, which is this four year cycle. And I think the cycle continues, not financial advice, um, but I think it continues and reaches new all time highs. Um, we've gone through the regulatory crackdown. We've probably got a few more in our industry. We need to find out uh, what, what, what the world is going to do with Binance and uh, what the US is going to try and do with Tether. And those are all uh, a few more dramas to come back. Um, and then we see what happens when the adults in the room, in the banks and the, the exchanges and the traditional regulated players enter the market. Um, and uh, we also st- get a live demonstration that Bitcoin actually has become this pristine asset that uh, in all of this has shined through and uh, just really been really proven that itself that it is in fact a, a new digital commodity and yeah it's volatile but if we get through the next cycle and the cycle after that and the cycle after that um, I think it cements itself in the world as digital hard sound money and I just feel privileged and grateful that I'm alive to experience that um, with all of you as well so always remember you're alive at one of the most interesting and exciting times in financial history Um, And uh, if you enjoy this, uh, please do share it. I'll put it up on YouTube when we get some chance as well for those that prefer YouTube. Um, And yeah, we'll see you next week. I'm going to be doing more practical personal finance stuff on uh, preparing for a Bitcoin and central bank digital currency world and how I manage some of my own financial affairs to try and protect myself in a world of massive uncertainty. Okay, thanks, everybody.